You are listening to Keystone Stock Talk Podcast, episode 104. If this is your first time listening, then thanks for stopping by. This podcast is produced every week for your enjoyment, and show notes are found at www.keystocks.com. Come back often, and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or on iTunes. You can also follow us on Twitter at Keystocks and on Facebook or via our 24-hour streaming radio station, pennystocks.fm. And keep submitting your stocks via the usual social channels or at our website, keystocks.com, for our Your Stock Our Take segment. And we just might review your stock in an upcoming show and let you know if it is a buy, sell, or hold. In our Your Stock, Our Take segment, we do a traditional quick take on one stock and introduce a comparison on two hot Canadian tech stocks. Our first company, Mav Beauty Products, symbol MAV on the TSX, is a personal care company which sells hair care, body care, and beauty products. Its products are sold in over 30 countries around the world and in over 100 major retailers. The stock which had been on a downward trend since its IPO in June of 2018, MAV has rebounded over 45% in the past five trading days. Uh, A quick comparison this week, our quick comparison this week, pits two hot mid-sized Canadian software companies against one another. The first, Canaxis, symbol KXS on the TSX, creates supply chain software, while the second, Enghouse Systems, ENGH on the TSX, is no stranger to our clients. Enghouse utilizes its existing software businesses to generate strong cash flow and creates growth through strategic acquisitions targeting software in the contact center, telco networks, and the transportation and public safety sectors. Both stocks have performed very well over the past year, and we take a look at their relative valuations. Finally, our dog of the week is Slack Technologies, Inc., symbol W-O-R-K, or work on the New York Stock Exchange. A business communication and remote work collaboration platform which offers features including persistent chat rooms, private groups, and direct messaging. Uh, The stock which has performed relatively well during COVID-19 is down 20% over the past three days. We let you know why. I'd like to welcome my two co-hosts to the show this week, Brennan and Aaron. How are you guys doing? Good. Good morning. I'm doing well. Good, good. good. Uh, you prepared for our uh, crisis portfolio building webinar tonight, 2.0. It's uh, June 9th today when we're recording this, 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time, and I believe that would be 6 p.m. Pacific as well. So love to see you at that event. Absolutely. And of course, this is this is the second, um, second webinar of this series. So we did a webinar last week. Uh, but every time we do it, even if it's just a week later, we're always we're updating the slides, we're looking at the market and any adjustments that we need to make in our our outlook or our commentary, uh, we make those adjustments so that people are getting getting up to date information. I always like to think that we learn a little bit every time we do this as well. And the goal for for us is to find the information that is of best value, the things that we've learned over the past twenty years that would be of best value to the attendees of the webinar. Uh, and give them the the in the most efficient way possible the advice that will help them manage their own portfolios long term. Yeah, for sure. At its core, these webinars will just show you how to take action during a crisis and start building that simple fifteen to twenty five stock portfolio, one that is designed to enrich you, not your advisor. Uh, we we have some new topics this time. We're looking at the current crisis. It'd be a tipping point potentially for technological change in areas such as work from home, cloud computing, cybersecurity, AI, and the Internet of Things. We're going to look at with the 10-year bond in the U.S. at 0.7 percent and in Canada at 0.5, 0.6 percent. Uh, how many of the dividend growth stocks that we recommend are yielding over five and a half percent, and they can be a powerful tool to generate income in your portfolio. We're also going to look at opportunities in healthcare, U.S. tech, gold, and alternative energy. 
And we have a bonus bit of content. I'm gonna go over how to deal with any hot stock tip you get and in about five minutes immediately classify it as either speculation or investment worthy. It's a quick little tidbit that we add in there that is really quite a valuable tool for you to evaluate those proverbial hot stock tips that you get. Finally, I'd say, you know, people always say, why should I attend these? Well, you know, proof is in the results. We believe uh, in our spring seminar, which is just a couple months ago, uh, we all five stocks that we recommended there are currently up. Uh, we had Photon Control that we recommended. It has jumped over 100% since that segment. Edge House, you know, we're going to talk about the company today, jumped 53% uh, since that uh, seminar as well. We're going to provide five new current buy recommendations. So if you want to take a little bit of your time and become a better investor, uh, attend that event. So yeah, let's also, get into the show. Sorry, yeah, before sorry. that, Ryan, if I could also just yeah. say like how valuable the Q&A session is uh, to attendees. You know, I probably listen to you guys talk uh, may- maybe too much and, and you might think that I'm sick of you guys, but that is definitely one of my favorite parts uh, of, you know, the webinars is just listening. You guys go off the cusp, uh, answering questions and giving meaningful answers, um, you know, always. And I think that that's just a great benefit to attendees. So just wanted to throw that in there. Um, I'll always enjoy that part. You know, excellent yeah, no, point. we enjoy doing it. Yeah. You know, and enjoy a, that's doing an it. hour. And, that's an hour of Q&A typically or, or a little over an hour sometimes. And people will essentially ask us anything they want about uh, some individual stocks. They can ask us to clarify information we discussed during the webinar or just any other questions that, that we didn't get into um, during during the program. So it's it's I, I, I certainly think, I mean, between the the content, the lessons that we're trying to teach, the starter portfolio and the and the Q and A at the end, uh, I I think we're you know we're out there trying to do the best job we can to get the best information out to investors. Yeah, it's great value for the ticket for sure. Good to hear. No, but we uh, we definitely uh, enjoy doing that. And I think when you rapid fire through like fifty questions in an hour, uh, you get a lot of information out there, and we get to we get to really show kind of some of the analysis that we do on those companies quickly. Now, I wanted to get into a couple of quick observations before we look at the companies this week. Uh, we've been going through, and we go through all the time, but quarterly numbers um, on Canadian companies and U.S., but I'm going to focus on some Canadian today. Uh, and just some observations. Um, look at, like I said, thousands of Q1 financial statements uh, over the past couple of months from Cam- Canadian companies. Uh, these include partial numbers from the COVID crisis. Uh, While we, you know, investments are always priced looking forward, the numbers that we're getting are like 30 to 60 days plus old right now. So we got to kind of, you've got to understand that they are numbers that aren't during the full COVID crisis. Uh, They're only partial numbers. Now during the current, we're seeing a V-shaped market recovery. And from an earnings perspective, we're seeing a couple of one-time events in these Q1 numbers that have made earnings numbers look better than they actually were in a more normalized environment. Um, In a number of sectors, because the first quarter ended March 31st, there was a huge amount of panic buying of certain goods and not just toilet paper, which we all hear out there. Uh, Right at the end of the quarter, we saw this. Um, We see we call this a stockpiling effect that is actually benefiting um, a number of industries out there. I'll give you an an example. And Brendan's going to actually highlight this company later. I looked at a cosmetic company that had a great Q1, relatively speaking, as it appears its clientele bought you know, five packs of eyeliner, for example, instead of buying the typically the one they would have um, for fear of being caught without you know, any of their lipstick or um, eyeliner, which I know is horrifying to someone like Aaron, right? I mean, of course, it, it is just absolutely horrifying, that thought. But we believe there is a good deal right now, very well stocked, for example, cosmetic bags out there during Q2 for so... This will likely make for a very weak set of Q2 numbers. They were going to be weak anyways, but they'll probably make them uh, even worse now as things open up. Now, Forex gains, this is the other thing that I would highlight, and it is very significant. For Canadian companies doing primary business in the U.S. or in U.S. dollars, uh, they've had big Forex gains in Q1, boost that goes straight to the bottom line, line, and that was caused by the rapid drop in the Canadian dollar Uh, when COVID hit during the calendar Q1. Uh, This is not operational earnings, so it's not sustainable. And it has reversed somewhat as of late. 
and we'll hit the reversal of that will hit likely in Q2, which is going to be a terrible quarter for some businesses without that. Now, a quick example of this is one of the Canadian small caps that we cover closely. Uh, in their Q1 numbers, they reported a $2.6 million Forex gain. Uh, with the company's operating income at about $6.5 million, that essentially increased net income by 40% in the quarter. And that is non-operational completely, but increased earnings. On, and then you show earnings on a per share basis, on a reported basis, about 40%. So it's something you have to factor into the numbers. Finally, the final item that I would note going into Q3 is most companies in Canada and you know throughout the globe really have pulled guidance given the unprecedented situation. So investors are flying blind, so to speak, into the upcoming quarter, which there was some stockpiling effects, some positive Forex environment uh, for Canadian companies. So you're flying into that quarter um, a little bit blind. Just a couple items that we will and you should keep an item on uh, or keep your eye on, sorry. The market is always looking forward and maybe it looks past these things, but I just hope investors are prepared for some pretty putrid numbers in Q2, Q2 at the very least and then to look maybe beyond that, but be prepared for those numbers. Exactly. We're, I, really, the economic fallout is, is, is still quite unknown. So now that things are starting to open up, restrictions are, are easing, a lot of people are going to be returning back to work, but a lot of people won't. I mean, there's certain industries like hospitality, airlines, uh, to let retail as well, where, where people won't be going back. And we also see a, a lot of businesses will probably be, be making cuts that have nothing to do with COVID. But they'll be making them because they, they'll see this as an opportunity just to uh, just to um, tighten up the ship, so to speak. So there's definitely going to be some economic fallout. It's largely unknown right now. Um, but really, you, you have to understand why a company's earnings or revenues are moving in a certain direction. So one of the areas where we think the, the growth has, has been more sustainable is in high technology and cloud computing. Um, because there has been a lot of transition into into cloud that was already a theme, already a trend, and this has really just accelerated that. Um, and then, of course, with cloud computing, um, with more digitalization, you need other supportive technologies like cybersecurity and whatnot. So those are often what we see as more sustainable trends. But if you're looking at, like, say, a, a grocer like a Walmart or a Costco, yeah, there's a lot of hoarding, a lot of stocking during the, during the quarantine and that's likely not going to continue to drive growth um, going forward. So always something to consider. You really need to not just look at the headline figures, but dig deep into the numbers. Yeah, definitely worry those one-time events that can happen that have boosted a few companies in the first quarter and uh, you know may actually contribute to an even weaker upcoming quarter. So you, know, you cannot extrapolate a number of those numbers out going forward. You know, in the areas that Aaron was talking about, definitely long-term positive trends, but some areas you really have to watch closely. Uh, one company, and it's a good segue into this, that has uh, you know gained a lot of attention during the um, the crisis was because of the remote work type situation. This is a company called Slack Technologies Inc. Its symbol is W O R K or Work. Uh, and uh, it currently trades at around thirty-one dollars. Market cap is seventeen and a half billion. Aaron, uh, you you wanted to take a look at that. Uh, it is our dog of the week. Certainly, and I've used Slack before as well to do some work. Uh, so the company is a business communication and remote collaboration platform. It has features like persistent chat rooms, private groups, direct messaging. Um, groups can essentially work together remotely through chat through Slack. And Slack reported around 12 million free and paid daily active users as of October of last year. The company's stock has been performing well in the COVID-19 environment and as demand for the new for the platform grew with the need for remote work. Uh, however, just over the past three trading days, the stock price has declined nearly 20%. I should start by saying that Slack is certainly not a stock that Keystone would generally spend a lot of time researching. The reason for this is that it right away fails our minimum criteria, which is profitability. Slack reported net loss of $70 million in the last quarter and over $570 million in the last year. However, revenue growth has been strong. Revenues at 50% in Q1 to over $200 million and up nearly 60% in 2019 to $630 million. 
We also know that there has been a small amount of positive operating cash flow in the last two consecutive quarters. Operationally, the company reported 122,000 paid customers in Q1, which is up 28% year over year. And this also included a record addition of 12,000 net new paid customers, which is up 50% compared to the same quarter in the previous year. Although the stock is down almost 20% in less than a week, this also has to be viewed in the context of the strong performance the stock had in the weeks beforehand. Slack shares right now are trading in the range of where they were only in late May, a couple of weeks ago. The Q1 result looked strong from a revenue and paid subscriber standpoint, but investors also have to understand that many of these high growth companies are already priced to perfection and the expectations that investors have are very high. Slack has a market cap of over $17 billion, which puts the price to sales valuation at about 25 times even after the recent pullback. Investors are expecting a high growth rate from a company like this, and many will sell if they start to see that, that growth rate decline, even if it just goes down from 60% to 30%. Another reason why we think the stock declined recently is that COVID-19 restrictions are starting to ease virtually everywhere. The expectation is that this is going to reduce the, the short-term need for remote work platforms, even if the long-term outlook for the space remains strong. Ultimately, for Keystone, this is not a company that we would consider investing in due to the lack of profitability. Uh, and even outside of, even, not, even, even notwithstanding the lack of profitability, the valuation relative to sales is quite high. Yeah, I think it's a good summary. And I think, you know, I think we're not saying we don't like the business or anything like that. Uh, you know, we, Aaron said he's used it. Is, you know, and we, we have a tech firm that works very closely with us. They say they love the technology there. It's just, I'm going to point out the valuations. Aaron talked about 25 times. That was 25 times sales. Like we look at 25 times cash flow or earnings and often like a multiple of 25 times cash flow could be or earnings could be on the higher end depending on the growth multiple. But I mean, this is 25 times sales and they don't even, they don't have E, they don't have earnings, they don't have cash flow. So we can't even value them based on cash flow. Great potential going forward, but they do have competition. Like Microsoft does have Microsoft Teams, which would be a competitor to this product. Uh, many in the industry say they like Slack better, but uh, you know there's certainly a ton of resources that uh, Microsoft can put behind that product to beef up their product as well. So, you know, Slack will watch. It's just we need that earnings or cash flow before we really want to pull the trigger for our clients. So we can move on to a, a quick segment here. We, we thought we'd do a comparison type segment because we got a question on uh, some a client wanted us to compare two companies, Eng House and Kinaxis, uh, and said, asked, which do we prefer? Now, uh, these businesses are, they performed very well over the past year, each of them, uh, in terms of share price and in terms of their underlying fundamentals. Uh, while the businesses are by no means apples to apples comparisons, we can take a quick look at what the businesses do and the multiples the market is asking you to pay for the stocks at present. So let's quickly look at what they do. Canaxis, symbol KXS on the TSX. Uh, it makes supply chain software. From all accounts, Canaxis has a Great products really at the right time. For example, the company's rapid response system has allowed customers to cope with unprecedented supply chain disruptions during the pandemic. And this likely bodes well for future growth as companies around the world rethink their supply chains. Now, as for Eng House, symbol E-N-G-H on the TSX, it's been around a lot longer than Canaxis as a public company. In fact, Eng House was the fourth best performing stock in Canada over the past decade. It is no stranger to our clients. The company utilizes its existing software businesses to generate strong cash flow and create growth through strategic acquisitions in a couple of er three areas, essentially, of uh, software. Contact centers, which it integrates with Microsoft Teams, uh, telco networks, uh, and the transportation and public service sectors. Now, the company made a couple of very opportune acquisitions uh, about a year ago uh, in the arenas of telemedicine and video communications, which play very well into the remote work space. So let's do a quick comparison of the numbers of these two companies. So the market cap on Eng House, let's look first, is around 300 or $3.58 billion. Canaxis has a larger market cap, about a billion more, $4.56 billion. So let's look at the last quarter in terms of revenues. 
Eng House did 140 million in revenues in the last quarter. Uh, Canaxis did 52.75, so just under three times less. Uh, and then there's growth, the growth for Eng House in the last quarter in terms of their revenues, 58%. The growth for Canaxis was 15%. The adjusted EBITDA in the last quarter for Enchouse was $49.3 million. Uh, adjusted EBITDA for Canaxis was $15 million. So, you know, Enchouses were three times larger. The growth in terms of adjusted EBITDA for Enchouse was 81% in the last quarter. The growth for Canaxis was actually negative 6%. The cash flow from operations for Enchouse in the last quarter, $50 million. Cash flow from operations was twenty million from Canaxis, so less than half. Growth uh, in terms of cash flow in the last quarter was seventy-two percent from Enchaus. From Canaxis was twelve percent. Cash on hand. Both of these are very cash-rich businesses. Uh, Enchaus had one hundred and sixty-eight million. Canaxis had two hundred and thirty-three million. So a little bit more cash in Canaxis, although, like we said, cash flow from operations was more than double. So Enchouse is building up more. So the valuations that you're asked to pay for these businesses in the market, enterprise value to expected EBITDA this year on adjusted basis is about twenty for Enchouse right now. Canaxis is about sixty-one. So three times more expensive is Canaxis on an EV to EBITDA basis. So what gives here, you might be asking. Higher market cap on Canaxis despite lower total revenues, cash flow, growth, etc. Well, you know, I'd say a couple things are at play here. Number one, um, number one is in the short term, the markets are not always correct. Now, perhaps Mr. Market will be proven correct here in this case in the long term, and perhaps it will not. But there are a few things that would pull into why Canaxis may have some things in its favor here. It is a higher percentage of SaaS sales and higher organic growth. Uh, The organic growth for uh, Canaxis might be low teens versus high single digit for Enchouse. Enchouse doesn't totally break out their numbers, but it is low single digits in that range, or higher single digits in that range in the last quarter. Anecdotally, one thing I find is that newer technology, which Canaxis falls into that range versus Enchouse, appears to receive higher valuations. They are shiny, shiny new toys where nothing can really go wrong. We haven't, you know, seen ten years of, uh, you know, with some mistakes in it from the business. So you see, you think investors believe nothing can go wrong. Now, again, some of the higher valuation comes from SaaS or software of a service model that many of these new technology companies employ. It's stickier in most cases and justifies a a higher premium and gives the business a higher degree of predictability going forward. Now, at times, this can be out of step with reality. In the case of Eng House, um, it can perhaps provide an opportunity for investors who are comparing the relative valuations on these two companies. Look, both are good companies. Neither are really cheap right now, but one you are clearly paying less for at present. So we would say that, you know, in our opinion, Eng House is clearly a lower price with a little bit less risk in terms of the valuations right now. And Encha, or uh, Canaxis is more, you know, it's, it's certainly a market darling out there, but it's priced to perfection. Well, Enchouse has been, a, how, how long ago, how, how long have, has Keystone had coverage on en- Enchouse, Ryan? Basically 10 years 10 now. years. So since it was trading at $4, it trades at about 65 today in that range. Yeah. And that just goes to show you that I don't think that Ange House has ever really been considered that exciting tech stock, but you don't necessarily no. have to pay up for that exciting tech stock to get a great return. And one of the things that we always, when we're talking about valuation and being price sensitive, is that we want to see that there's an opportunity for the valuation multiple even to expand. And I think that that's certainly what happened with Ange House over the yes. over the ten years. I mean that the the stock price growth phenomenal was driven by growth in earnings and cash flow per share, but also the valuation um, of price to earnings or cash flow expanded as well. So it's it's we want to see that valuation as being able to expand. Whereas when you buy these companies that are already trading at, you know, 75, 100, 150 times earnings or more, how much valuation expansion can you really see? Yeah, and, and then we talked about it there. Eng House, enterprise value to EBITDA, 20 versus expected next year's versus Canaxis at 61. Now, 
both good businesses, both, uh, you know, stocks that you may want to own for the long term. But, you know, you're paying three times more on a term in terms of EV to EBITDA for one of them. Uh, so, you know, you have to factor that into your analysis when you buy the business, whether or not you're comfortable doing that. Because when you know have, like Aaron said, when you have a premium valuation, if anything goes wrong, you know, it can really get it can really get hurt. And, uh, you know, you just have to be aware of that. If nothing goes wrong going forward, that business continues to do tremendously well, likely. So I think our final uh, company we're looking at is our weekly star, Mav Beauty Brands, symbol MAV on the TSX. And Brennan's going to take that one. I am. Okay, so Mav Beauty Brands is currently trading at a price of around $3.48, and it has a market cap of $138 million. So Mav Beauty Brands is a global personal care company dedicated to providing consumers with a wide variety of hair care, body care, and beauty products. Uh, and its products are sold in over 30 countries around the world uh, and in over 100 major retailers. Um, so since its IPO in June of 2018, the stock has been consistently trending lower uh, and was certainly sold off during the initial COVID-19 uh, outbreak. But more recently, the stock was up over 45% in the past five trading days, driven by better than expected Q1 financial results. Um, so these results uh, released on June 5th, uh, keep in mind all in US dollars actually, uh, revenue increased by 30% to $31.4 million compared to the same quarter last year. Adjusted EBITDA increased by 34% to $8.3 million uh, from $6.2 million in Q1 of 2019. And basic adjusted uh, earnings per share increased 43% to $0.10 cents per share uh, from $0.07 cents per share for the prior year period. Now, management did provide some commentary uh, following the quarter, stating that first quarter sales and adjusted EBITDA showed strong year-over-year -year increases from healthy organic growth and the addition of the main choice, uh, which was an, an acquisition that was announced in November of 2019, uh, and it's a brand serving the hair care market. Uh, furthermore, management said that first quarter sales reflect the positive impact of 2020 shelf gains and consumers stocking up on essential items as the majority of North American food, drug, and mass retailers have remained open during lockdowns. So. The question to ask here is whether this increase in sales is sustainable considering people were stockpiling necessities before the crisis. Um, and does it mean that future quarters will be weaker since people have bought an abundance of supplies for the future already? This is something that we are going to have to remain cognizant on uh, as, as we navigate financial statements that were impacted by COVID-19. And, and Ryan did address that a little bit earlier. So. Mav has had a decent trajectory of revenue and adjusted EBITDA growth over the past few years, and it's why we're, we've been keeping our eye on it. Looking at their balance sheet, they have a net debt position of around $152 million and a net debt to adjusted EBITDA multiple of over four and a half times, indicating that the company is highly levered, especially for a retail company. On a current valuation basis, they are trading at a trailing enterprise value to adjusted EBITDA multiple of around eight times, which I believe is attractive for the growth that the company has been showcasing. To conclude, we have been monitoring uh, MAV for some time because of its impressive growth and decently attractive valuation. Despite these attractive fundamentals, it is not a current recommendation of Keystone. We will continue to monitor it, especially the sustainability of the company's sales in future quarters, but its recent share price performance after its positive financial results that were somewhat propelled by the COVID-19 pandemic make it our star of the week. Yeah, I think it's a good summary, and it's it's uh, appropriate to highlight the high debt levels in the business there that give us a uh, reason for concern. They have it looks like made a number of acquisitions, and they did some, you know those out of debt. They had increased increased sales, and uh, you know their profitability looked good in the last period. But was that some stockpile pull forward from this quarter? So we'll have to monitor it in the next quarter, and and we ha we have to see whether or not you know all the debt is coming just from acquisitions. Because it's, if it's coming from acquisitions and there's not much organic growth, then at some point you can't keep on layering debt to the business 
uh, or, you know, or else, you know, you just, there's, there's too much debt to service in this business. Now, like we talked about Ench House, which is a business that grows via acquisitions. Uh, they're not layering on debt. There's no debt in the business though. They're, uh, a cash flow cow. We said they had 50 million in operational cash flow in the last quarter. So they take in that cash flow. Then they're able to buy other businesses with that cash flow. They don't have to go out and dilute shareholders or go into debt to do so. So that's a beautiful business model. And our, uh, from our perspective uh, if you keep having to go in debt or keep having to go to the market to grow and um, can't grow on a per share basis which is tough to do when you're doing those things then you know it's something that you have to monitor and you have to be wary of in a business and Mav is a company we're monitoring but again they've gone into quite a bit of debt uh, that net debt ratio right now is quite high so we'll have to keep an eye on that going forward yeah, and it's good to note just that, you know, there's three ways to raise cap- capital or, you know, for future investment in a business. And the best way to do it is cash. I believe the second best way to do it, you know, debt. And then the last is diluting shareholders further. So, uh, so yeah, it's always good to. Yeah, good and to it know. can be a tightrope. You can walk all those things together and, uh, you know, combine them in some forms. But, um, you know, ideally, it'd be nice to be able to generate cash flow and just do it that way. So for some businesses, that's very difficult to do. And, it, you know, if not impossible, but. Uh, you know, really capital intensive businesses that haven't built up a base, right? It's it's difficult mm-hmm. to do, but yeah, for sure. If you could model a business perfectly, that would be a great way to grow. Um, and then have the organic growth in the business as well. I mean, that would be the perfect business. Most often we don't see 10 out of 10 boxes checked in a business. No, so it's that'd be very theory. difficult. It's good in theory. Yeah. yeah, but it is good for sure. If you wanted mm-hmm. to look for a perfect business. Now, I believe that's going to end it for this week. Uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to, if you can't grab a ticket for um, the show this evening uh, or the, the uh, uh, seminar this evening, our live streaming seminars, then, you know, there's one next week. Grab it for that. And uh, we'd love to see you in there. And as always, stay safe out there. And we'd like to wish to you profitable investing. Thank you. Profitable investing. Thanks, everyone.